I'd like to welcome our uh, Zoom audience back to the series Perspectives on Ancient Nubia. Um, we're very excited for uh, today's speaker, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but first, we uh, start these presentations off uh, with a land state BLM statement. Um, so if I could uh, invite our um, statement reader from the Bade Museum to provide that for our audience. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We would like to start by acknowledging that Berkeley, California is on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Totenio Ohlone. We respect the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations, and we honor their elders, both past and present. There is no question that our society is posed at a moment of change. We see it when fellow Americans are unjustly detained, when our citizens are wrongly harmed, and when our communities are in the streets for months on end protesting in order to be heard. The Bade Museum of Biblical Archaeology and the Archaeological Research Facility, ARF, at UC Berkeley wish to acknowledge the pain and outrage of our community members who bear the weight of existing in a society designed to work against them and feel the devastation most keenly. Here at the museum and at ARF, we have been moved by the courage of those most deeply affected and the tenacity of those protesting for change. The Bade Museum and ARF stand in solidarity with the African-American community. We join you in your calls for justice. Collectively and individually, our staff condemns the produce brutality and systematic racism that has long been enacted against the black community and other communities of color. It has persisted for far too long. It has resulted in the unjust and premature ending of lives. So let us say their names. Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmed Aubrey, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and countless others. Let us as organizations be perfectly clear. Black lives matter. We lend our thoughts and actions to those who every day actively work to make this statement a living, breathing ideal and to those who continually live the reality of racial injustice. Likewise, we lend our expertise to the cause by incorporating BLM sensitive material into our exhibits, our programming and our curriculum. We know very well that this moment has been a long time coming and we are in the fight for equality, justice and accountability. Though this lecture series, oh, sorry. Through this lecture series, we aim to raise awareness of ancient Nubia, a vibrant region in Northeast Africa with a rich archeological and historical legacy. Learning about the ancient peoples of Nubia is one way to decenter the usual academic focus on Egypt and biblical and classical lands in order to reconceptualize the past. Decolonizing our views of the past as through the research presented in the new perspectives on ancient Nubia series, we hope will lead to a more just present and equitable future. Thank you, Jess. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Solange Ashby. Solange received her PhD in Egyptology with a specialization in ancient Egyptian language and Nubian religion from the University of Chicago. She has conducted research in Egypt at the and participated in an archeological exhibition at El Huru in Sudan. Her dissertation explored the prayer inscriptions of Nubian groups that traveled to the Egyptian temples of lower Nubia, including Philae. Dr. Ashby's expertise in sacred ancient languages, including Egyptian hieroglyphs, Demotic and Coptic, Egyptic, Biblical Greek, Hebrew inscriptions underpins her research into the history of religious transformation in Northeast Africa and the Middle East during the period when monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam replaced traditional religion in each Nubia. Her first book, Calling Out to Isis, The Enduring Nubian Presence at Philae, is published by Georges Press. Her current research explores the roles of women in traditional Nubian religious practices. Dr. Ashby is working on the first monograph dedicated to the history, religious symbolism, and political power of the Queens of Kush. Dr. Ashby teaches in the Department of Classics and Ancient Studies at Barnard College. 
presentation today is entitled Sacred Dancers, Nubian Women as Priestesses of Hathor. Welcome, Dr. Ashby. The floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. I will start by sharing my screen. I'd just like to thank the Bade Museum for hosting this really important lecture series to bring a greater understanding of this amazing ancient culture uh, and still living culture of Nubia. This lecture is based on my paper published in the online journal called Dotawo, a journal of Nubian studies. Volume five published in 2018 was dedicated to the Nubian woman and edited by Dr. Ann Jennings, an American anthropologist whose book Nubian Women of West Aswan, Negotiating Tradition and Change was prominent in my early reading on Nubia. This article focused on the long history of Nubian women as depicted in Egyptian art. In this talk, I will examine intermittent but regular appearances of chocolate skinned women among the depictions of dancers of Hathor in Egyptian tomb and temple scenes. Although these women are referred to in temple texts and visual depictions throughout Egyptian pharaonic history, today I will focus on the priestesses of Hathor in Egypt's middle kingdom roughly 2000 to 1600 BCE. I will explore themes such as the scholarly debate about the ethnicity of these women. I want to make explicit at the outset that I do not view these Nubian women uh, whom I discussed to be foreigners in Egypt. Nubians and Egyptians have been living, working and intermarrying for the entirety of their shared history. Thus, it should come as no surprise that Nubian women were depicted as central participants in the religious rites of a goddess who is so deeply associated with Nubia, a land that the Egyptians called Ta Seti. I will begin by introducing the goddess Hathor and her priestesses, highlighting the roles and often royal status of these women during Egypt's old kingdom. I will then discuss six women who were queens of the Middle Kingdom Pharaoh Mentuhotep II. They are the focus of this lecture. After describing their funerary goods and the titles they held, I will briefly describe the ritual landscape of the area around the funerary monument of Mentuhotep II, its associations with the goddess Hathor, who was worshiped in two temples located to the north and south of the king's burial. I will then discuss the votive offerings dedicated to the goddess, two tattooed women found buried nearby and additional grave goods from the area that allude to the prominent worship of the goddess Hathor and a Nubian presence in the region. I will describe a contemporaneous Nubian population referred to as the C group in order to draw parallels between their traditional female attire and the regalia associated with priestesses of Hathor. Finally, Egyptian textual sources from the New Kingdom and Ptolemaic period record the name of a sacred dance called Keskes associated with Nubian worshipers of the goddess Hathor as the chief protagonist of the myth of the distant goddess. I will present one such source, a temple hymn from the Ptolemaic period. Hathor, the goddess of love, music, dance, childbirth, sexuality, and divine drunkenness is one of the oldest goddesses worshiped in pharaonic Egypt. She's often portrayed as a cow or a cow headed woman, or even a woman with cow ears. The name Hathor is actually a Greek rendering of the Egyptian name Hut Her, meaning the temple or enclosure of Horus. You can see the writing of her name in the center of this hieroglyphic text. 
In the mythical realm, Hathor is partner to Horus, who is manifest in the king of Egypt. This inscription links the goddess with Thebes, the southern capital of Egypt. It reads from right to left, Anubis, lord of the sacred land, Hathor, mistress or ruler of Thebes. Hathor was honored with many epithets. The beautiful one, gifted bronze mirrors, the goddess is most pleased when her beauty is reflected back to her. The gold, she was associated with gold producing regions of Egypt's Eastern desert and Nubia. Mistress of foreign lands, she was worshiped in Nubia and in the Sinai land outside of Egypt proper. Lady of the vulva, an explicit reference to Hathor's association with sacred sexuality and recognition of honor given to women for the ability of their bodies to bring forth life. Lady of Turquoise, Hathor is associated with the turquoise mining regions in the Sinai Peninsula. Lady of Intoxication, this makes reference to the consumption of beer in the rites performed for Hathor but also alludes to the divine drunkenness attained by those who participated in nocturnal rites performed for the goddess. Who comes from Ta Seti. In many hieroglyphic texts, the goddess is said to have come to Egypt from Ta Seti, an Egyptian name for Nubia, which means the land of the bow, and thus makes reference to the preferred weapon of Nubia. Hathor's association with the land of Nubia is elucidated in a myth called the Tale of the Sun's Eye or the Return of the Distant Goddess to which I will return later. I will suggest that traditional forms of ritual music and dance, a central element in the religious practice of Nubians were incorporated into Egyptian rites performed for the goddess Hathor whose origin in Nubia and journey to Egypt would have been celebrated appropriately with Nubian music and dance. A type of dance called the Keskes dance attributed to Nubians in Egyptian hieroglyphic texts was incorporated into Egyptian rites performed for Hathor during the Middle Kingdom when Egypt colonized Nubia and came into intense contact with the sea group people living there. For those of you unfamiliar with Egypt's long dynastic history, this table lists the canonical divisions of Egyptian history into kingdoms, old, middle, and new, each of which is made up of a number of dynasties. While the first priestesses of Hathor appear during the old kingdom, the women whom I will discuss live during the middle kingdom. Before turning to their story, let's take a moment to explore the first attestations of the goddess Hathor and her priestesses in the Old Kingdom, which consist of the third to the sixth dynasties. The earliest priestesses of Hathor are attested in the mid fourth dynasty of the Egyptian Old Kingdom and reached an apogee under the fifth dynasty. The title Priestess of Hathor appears suddenly in the mid fourth dynasty. It is held by Nefer Hetepes, daughter of King Rajedef. Her complete title is Priestess of Hathor, Mistress of the Sycamore. More than 400 priestesses of Hathor are attested as well as priestesses of other deities. I'd like to quote from Robin Gillum, who wrote a brief history of the priestesses of Hathor in her 1995 article in the Journal of the American Research Center in Egypt. Quote, during the Old Kingdom in particular, women's role in the central cult was matched by greater participation in positions of authority than in later periods of Egyptian history. From the middle of the fifth dynasty onwards, we also find them holding titles in connection with music, singing, and dancing, end quote. The role of Hemet Necher, that is priestess, 
was to feed and clothe a temple's divine statue daily. Gillam notes the presence of Hathor priestesses in Techna, where Hathor is called Mistress of the Valley Mouth and Kusai, both of which were important Old Kingdom sites located in Middle Egypt. During the Mid Old Kingdom, we have also the first appearance of the Kenner Troupe, a group of primarily female music musicians and dancers in the service of the goddess Hathor. The fourth dynasty king, Menkau Re, commissioned several monuments in which he was depicted with Hathor. We see the king striding hand in hand with the goddess and the deified gnome, as the districts of Egypt are called, of Sinopolis on the left of your screen and standing next to the seated goddess with the deified hair gnome on the right. Both monuments seek to associate the king with Hathor. In each case, the king wears the white crown of Upper Egypt, this elongated tall crown, associating him with the south, just as his predecessor, Khafre, had in the Valley Temple associated with his pyramid at Giza. There, the king was quote unquote, beloved of Hathor on the southern door jam and quote unquote, beloved of Bastet on the northern door jam, alluding to a geographical sphere of influence for each goddess, Bastet to the north and Hathor to the south. In the 11th dynasty, now moving into the middle kingdom, we see a continued association of priestesses of Hathor with women of the royal family. Six women associated with King Mentuhotep II are designated as priestesses of Hathor. They also carry the royal titles King's wife and sole ornament of the king. The women's names were Kawit, Ashayet, Henhanit, Kemsit, Sade, and Mayet or Tamayet. Each woman was buried in an individual shrine located along the rear ambulatory of Mentuhotep II's funerary monument in De Deir el Bakri. Unfortunately, almost nothing of the monument survives. The women's burials were excavated by Herbert Winlock of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York early in the 20th century. Many of the queen's funerary objects can be found on display in the Met, which has several rooms dedicated to them. The large stone sarcophagus of Henhanit is on display in one of those galleries. Regarding the ethnicity of these women, Winlock, the excavator, confirms Derry's earlier description of the six women as Nubian. And he writes of them dismissively as, quote unquote, dancing girls of Neb Hepet Re, the throne name of Mentuhotep II. And I quote Winlock here. Derry had already noticed that the features of the tattooed dancing girls buried in the Neb Hepet Re temple showed marked Nubian traits, and that Nubian blood had probably flowed through the veins, even of such ladies of the king's harem as Ashayet and Henhanit. Furthermore, the pictures of Ashayet on her sarcophagus give her a rich chocolate Nubian complexion, and her companion Kemsit was painted, painted on hers an actual ebony black, just like these little figures." End quote. While Pinch, Geraldine Pinch, a scholar who has written about votive offerings to Hathor, notes that the figurines found in Mentuhotep II's funerary complex bear markings paralleled on contemporaneous Nubian C group figurines, Pinch refers to the mummies of the priestesses of Hathor described above to declare that neither the figurines nor the priestesses were Nubian women, and I quote Pinch. This need not mean that the Egyptian figurines represent Nubians, 
since three 11th dynasty mummies of light-skinned women with tattoos on their thighs, stomachs, and shoulders were recovered from the precincts of Ak Isut, the Egyptian name for the funerary complex of Mentuhotep II, end quote. A more balanced interpretation of the possible ethnicity of these women is found in Ellen Morris's discussion of Middle Kingdom paddle dolls, who she suggests, quote, were representations of specific living women, namely late Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom Kenner dancers of Hathor at Deir el Bakri, end quote. Morris goes on to say, quote, the visibility of Nubian styles in the court of Neb Hepet Ray has been much discussed, and this co occurrence of bodily decoration in the Theban court and in Nubia need not be a coincidence. End quote. So this is a, an open bay on the west bank um, at the site of Thebes in southern Egypt, uh, the capital both for the 11th dynasty and then for the 18th dynasty. And so we see here um, the well-known funerary monument of the 18th dynasty queen who ruled as Pharaoh, Hatshepsut. And then you'll see this sort of sad empty space off to the left. This is where the funerary monument uh, of Mentuhotep II used to stand. Here is an artist's sketch um, of both monuments from above. We can see the monument of Hatshepsut on the right and then the artist uh, imagining of what the earlier um, funerary monument of Mentuhotep II might have looked like. It's uh, interesting to note that this is the 11th dynasty, so dated to about 2000 BCE, uh, while that of Hatshepsut is from about 500 years later um, in, uh, the 18th dynasty. Um, so she's very much um, paying homage to uh, her ancestor, Mentuhotep II. The priestess's shrines were aligned along the back area of an ambulatory on the podium of the king's complex. while immediately to the north lay an ancient grotto in which the goddess Hathor had been worshiped. In later times, a temple to Hathor was built at this site, um, both by Hatshepsut and her successor, uh, Thutmose III. In pit burials, 23 and 26, as numbered in Winlock's uh, excavation reports, to the east of the grotto, two tattooed women were found buried in pit graves. So this uh, is the sarcophagus or a painting of a sarcophagus of one of those priestesses of Hathor and queen of Mentuhotep II. This watercolor facsimile of the exterior of Ashayat's sarcophagus now in Cairo depicts Ashayet as a brown-skinned woman sitting before her shrine, smelling a lotus blossom associated with rebirth and receiving funerary offerings. Julian Cooper has recently written about the name of one of the two dark-skinned women on the right. He suggests that the woman's name preserved in hieratic script above her image can be identified as derived from a Cushitic language ancestral to Beja, now spoken in the eastern desert of Egypt and Nubia. The label, label identifies her as the Magi Lady Mekkenet, depicted on the far right. To quote Cooper from his recently published article in the online UCLA Encyclopedia of Egyptology, quote, the name Mekkenet perfectly matches the Cushitic lexical root Keken, so K dotted H N, meaning to love. 
known in Beja, Saho Afar, so spoken in Ethiopia and Somali, with the common Afro-Asiatic nominalizing M prefix appended to the root, end quote. I'd like to also just point out that um, this Beja or uh, Mejai lady has a, a basket carrying case and you can see the handle of an up ended uh, mirror in that case. So yet another uh, reference to the worship uh, of the goddess Hathor. Here we see uh, Kawit as depicted on her stone sarcophagus, having her hair fixed, holding a mirror, and being offered a drink, all ritual actions associated with the celebration of the goddess Hathor. And you can see uh, the handle of the mirror looks very similar to that one um, in the previous image from the sarcophagus of Ashayet. One of three tattooed women found buried near the funerary complex of Mentuhotep II, Amunit held the titles sole royal ornament and priestess of Hathor. Um, a sketch of her tattoos shows that they are meant to emphasize the erogenous zones of her stomach and pelvic region. Some of these markings were cicatrices, raised scarification, in addition to the tattoos that decorated her body. And I'd like to say you might notice that I'm switching back and forth between two or three um, uh, mummified women uh, with tattoos. And that's because we, the knowledge of where Amun, Amunit's original uh, place of burial has been lost in the more or less 100 years since it was excavated. So we're not quite sure if she was buried um, in the uh, funerary monument of Mentuhotep II or um, slightly north of it in the pits near where these other two women were excavated. So on the right, a sketch of the mummified remains of two other tattooed women found in pit burials to the north in the north courtyard show this diamond-shaped tattooing on the breast, down an arm, and on her thighs. Tattooed women preserved as mummies from the 11th Dynasty funerary monument of Mentuhotep II at Deir el-Bakri bore designs otherwise found only on contemporaneous C-group women of Lower Nubia. The diamond shaped tattoos are similar to those characteristic of C group Nubian pottery, which continue a decorative pattern visible in earlier A group pottery and on female figurines from Nubian prehistory. So this pattern is very long lived. The attire of Egyptian priestesses of Hathor exhibits many similarities with that of C group Nubian women. So cowrie shell belts, uh, you can see that on these figurines here and on this uh, young woman sketched from, I think the date is 1820. Uh, these crossed bead necklaces that we also see on the figurines, see those uh, in C group women and colorful worked leather skirts. These brightly patterned skirts of worked leather were found buried with high status women in the royal city of Kerma, so far south uh, of the area under discussion today, as well as in the C Group Cemetery at Hierakompolis in Egypt. In many instances, C Group women's grave goods included bronze mirrors and sistra, so these sacred rattles, uh, sacred to the goddess Hathor. Um, both of these were cultic instruments related to the worship of Hathor. How might the typical attire of C group women have come to be incorporated into the regalia of priestesses of Hathor? The myth of the distant goddess might offer a clue. In the Ptolemaic period temple, so now quite a bit later, about 330 to 30 BCE, uh, this temple uh, dedicated to the god Montu at Metamud, located just north of the great temple of Karnak, contains hieroglyphic text of a hymn 
dedicated to Hathor uh, and describes the dancing Nubians who accompanied the goddess on her return from Nubia in her manifestation as Tefnut, the Eye of Ray. And so I've just included some images here uh, from the Temple of Philae, uh, where we see uh, this lion-headed goddess uh, that's Tefnut with a very large solar disc on her head to represent her father, Ray, the sun god, and then in front of her, the god Shu, who is leading her back to Egypt. The myth or legend of the sun's eye is preserved in 11 different Egyptian demotic texts dated to the second and third centuries of the common era, so AD. Although the tale itself may date as early as the new kingdom. Additionally, a Greek papyrus now in the British library is a translation of this Egyptian myth. Although these tales all postdate the Middle Kingdom priestesses of Hathor under discussion here, this tale was likely transmitted orally for centuries before being committed to writing. In the myth of the sun's eye, an enraged Tefnut in the form of a bloodthirsty lion goddess stalked the earth devouring humanity, which had rebelled against her father Re while he reigned as king in Egypt. The Egyptian gods Shu and Thoth traveled to Bugam in southeastern Nubia, where they transformed into monkeys in order to safely approach the lion goddess. The two gods danced, plied the goddess with copious amounts of wine, and spoke magical spells to pacify and beguile Tefnut so that she might be calmed and enticed to travel to Egypt. Soothed by the dance, of Shu and the magical words of Thoth and thoroughly intoxicated on the wine they offered to her, Tefnut was convinced to make the journey from Nubia to Egypt. At the border between the two lands, the flames of the goddess's wrath were cooled in the waters at the mythical source of the Nile that emerged in the vicinity of the island of Philae at the first cataract. At this initial point of entry into Egypt, Tefnut was transformed by the cool waters and became Hathor, the goddess of music, dance, love, and drunkenness. Her arrival and transformation at the temple complex on Philae would have been celebrated with singing, dancing, and rejoicing to mark the return of the distant goddess from her sojourn in Nubia. Performing sacred dances for Hathor, Nubian dancers, musicians, and acrobats were a recurring theme in representations of Hathoric rites, jubilees, and banquet scenes for millennia. C-group women participated in the worship of Hathor by engaging in traditional Nubian dances, which were viewed by the Egyptians as exotic and erotic. A close examination of Egyptian depictions of Nubian women dancing reveals the characteristics of the woman's dance and provides the Egyptian name for their style of dance. The Keskes dance was acrobatic involving leaps and flips. The women performed wearing leather skirts, cowrie shell girdles and bore tattoos on their breasts, abdomens and thighs. And I should, uh, say that these images I'm using simply to um, depict, to show how dance was depicted in ancient Egypt. These were not necessarily Nubian women that I'm showing here, although they might have been. The beautiful, this beautiful jewelry belonged to the 12th dynasty princess Sit Hathor Unit, whose name means daughter of Hathor of Dendera. She was probably in life the daughter of uh, the Egyptian king Senwasrit II because her burial is incorporated into his funerary complex in Lahun in the Fayum, so in Northern Egypt. Sid Hathor Unit's jewelry contains the motifs that we have seen associated with Nubian worship of the goddess Hathor. Cowrie shells now formed from gold and silver the ostrich feather of the god Shu, shown here in silver, one of the two gods tasked with retrieving Hathor from Nubia. 
as well as leopard's claws, perhaps a reference uh, to the goddess Tefnut, the form taken by Hathor as she raged in the deserts of Nubia before returning to Egypt. The prophecy of Nefertiti foretells the coming of a savior king, a many, likely a reference to Amenemhat, founder of the 12th dynasty. And I quote from that Egyptian literary text. But then there shall come from there shall come a king from the south. His name will be Ameni, justified. He will be the son of a woman of Taseti, an offspring of the royal house of Neken. He shall receive the white crown. He shall wear the red crown. He shall unite the two powers. End quote. And I thank Dr. Salim Faraji for bringing um, this uh, Egyptian literary reference to a woman of Tasseti to my attention. Amenemhat asserts his legitimacy by claiming descent from a woman of Nubia, Tasseti, and by proclaiming himself an offspring of the royal house of Neken, also known as Hierakompolis. Not coincidentally, there was an early Nubian presence at Hierakompolis. The discovery of the preserved remains of tattooed Nubian women in cemetery HK27C is quite relevant to this talk. Why does Amenemhat claim for himself descent from Nubia and Neken, a very important city in the pre-dynastic period? I would like to suggest that these Nubian priestesses from the cult of Hathor served to legitimize their son to rule as king of Egypt. Mentuhotep II, married to Nubian priestess of, priestesses of Hathor, also claims legitimacy to rule Egypt by stating that he is a son of Hathor. A stela, shown here on the right, depicts the king suckling at the udders of the goddess Hathor in her cow form. So you can just see his head underneath the cow at this point of break in the stela. The upper part of a round-topped limestone stela depicts the Hathor cow suckling the figure of the king, only his head is visible. Another royal figure stands beneath the head of the cow. A representation of the mountains of Deir el-Bakri in the background uh, is indicated by two parallel wavy lines. Three columns of hieroglyphic text above include an epithet of the goddess Hathor as Lady of Jesuit. Priestesses of Hathor were well attested in the 11th dynasty, most prominently during the reign of Mentuhotep II. However, by the end of the reign of Senwasrit III of the 12th dynasty, priestesses of Hathor all but disappear from the historical record. The disappearance of priestesses of Hathor was part of a larger removal of women from public life that was all but complete by the end of the Middle Kingdom. So we can see this period uh, during Mentuhotep's reign as um, the most prominent period of Nubian women appearing as uh, priestesses of Hathor. So now to look at um, the culture uh, of these Nubian women. The C group is closely related, if not identical, to the earliest phase of the Kerma culture south of the third cataract in the Sudan. The C group likely migrated from the south or southwest and settled in the most fertile places between the first and the second cataract of the Nile. Primarily pastoralist herders of sheep, goats, and cattle their homes consisted of circular structures. Population centers developed in areas where the alluvial land was more spacious, such as Dhaka, Aniba, Kustul and Balana, and Faras. Each of these sites continued to be important uh, centers throughout Nubian history. In Egyptian depictions, C group men wear a half length coiffer with a headband and tight kilts covered with beadwork. They often have a bow and arrow in their hands, while the women wear brightly co colored worked leather skirts. 
Friedman, uh, who excavates at uh, the site of Hierakampolis in Egypt, notes the appearance of such articles of clothing in the C Group Cemetery at Hierakampolis, quote, garments made of a patchwork of brown, beige, pink, red, and yellow leather panels were found in several graves, but almost exclusively those of women. In these cases, they may be the multicolored skirts as described by Reisner, who excavated at Kerma, discussed by Juncker, who excavated at Kubania near um, uh, Aswan and Philae at the first cataract, and depicted on Nubian women in the tomb of Hui. Similar attire is seen on tattooed dancers on Ramesid Ostraca, one of which clearly shows dancing girls, some of whom are tattooed in a manner similar to the female in Tomb 9 at Hierakampolis, wearing cutwork, presumably leather loincloths, as part of their special performance attire. And so I've shown this um, uh, Ramesid Ostrakhan that Dr. Friedman is referring to. And you can see this woman is doing a, clearly an acrobatic move in her dance and her cutwork uh, leather skirt here, and then this diamond shaped uh, tattoo on her thigh. Geometric ornamentation, which shows not only on pottery and basket work, but also on beadwork and body tattoo can be considered a specific feature of the C group culture. The priestesses of Hathor, whom I contend uh, are of C group Nubian ancestry, would have lived during uh, late phase 1b on this uh, table in the bottom center of the screen uh, or early into phase 2a of the Nubian C group. This is a period when bronze mirrors begin to be buried with the deceased uh, and we see a prevalence of this lozenge pattern uh, on their, their pottery. As the northernmost C group population center was in the vicinity of Dhaka, so close up by southern Egypt, uh, I will describe the rites of Nubians who arrived at the temple of Philae from Dhaka. However, keep in mind that they are much later than the period under discussion. Uh oh. In the first century CE, Nubian worshipers made uh, an annual journey to Philae to participate in rites for Hathor and the Nubian gods Arns Nufis and Thoth of Penobs. Egyptian demotic inscriptions found on the temple walls at Philae tell us that the Nubian worshipers arrived at the temple during the harvest season. Parrot. Ritual uh, rites enacted in the evening as promised in the demotic inscription Philae 24, recall the nocturnal celebrations in honor of Hathor, which included drinking, music, dancing, and the hen gesture, gesture of bending the elbows in worship. So looking like this. Circumstantial evidence suggests that such rites were the focus of the early Nubian inscriptions at Philae, which were engraved on the structures in the open area in front of the main temple. So you can see on this beautiful uh, aerial shot of the main temple uh, dedicated to Isis here, this is the open uh, forecourt area where uh, these rites would have been performed in the first century AD. The forecourt was the area traditionally reserved for public celebration of rites, an area accessible to worshipers who were not allowed to enter the temple. A quote from a hymn inscribed on the temple walls at Meta Mood describes the nocturnal celebrations for Hathor. Quote, come O golden one who eats of praise because her desire, the food of her desire is dancing who shines on the festival at the time of lighting the lamps, who is content with the dancing at night. Come, the procession is in the place of inebriation. 
And so here are a couple of images from the very small temple of Hathor um, located off to the right of the main temple of Isis. So uh, if you could see through this kiosk here, it's the small little temple of Hathor. And on the columns in the forecourt of that uh, temple, we see uh, images on the right of a dwarf, a dancing dwarf playing a tambourine and a baboon playing a lute as part of these, uh, this music performed for the goddess Hathor. And so I'll just uh, conclude, oops, there's the temple of Hathor. I'll just conclude um, with this modern observation. I couldn't help but be struck by the similarity of the Keskes dance with the right arm raised, left arm lowered behind to one that I saw described in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in September of 2016. In an article entitled The Nakil Depression appeared the following quote um, along with the image you see on the screen. So those of you who don't know, the Nakil Depression is a vast, um, open salt bed, uh, very, very hot lowlands in the east of Ethiopia where the Afar people live. So this is the quote from the New York Times. But there were moments so full of joy and so pure, like when my guide Ali ran into his friend in the middle of nowhere, this vast white desert, and they were so happy to see each other. They did the keke dance, a dance of joy, he told me that when you meet an old friend, you dance like this with your hand uh, in the air. It was so beautiful because it was so unexpected. So thank you for your attention. And I will wrap up with this uh, image of me in front of a Nubian house uh, in the village of West Aswan uh, in Egypt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashby, for that wonderful talk. Um, I especially loved your modern connection. It seemed like it was um, a time of jubilation. So I can see the correlation to what you spoke about briefly. Uh, you do have a lot of questions, which is fantastic, should lead to some great discussion. Um, so I will start with uh, this question that asks, I'm wondering your opinion on the goddess bot and her relationship to Hathor within the context of Nubian priestesses and the role of the Sistrum? The goddess Bat. Um, yeah, she, she does appear as probably the person asking the question knows on these very early um, ceremonial palettes, right? Before um, there even was uh, Pharaonic Egypt. Um, she's shown at the top uh, of the palette with her beautiful curving horns. Um, I, I just will say that I think that that goddess Bat and Hathor are part of this uh, whole pantheon of cow goddesses that we see um, in ancient Egypt. And they have many names, even this late temple at Philae that was built like 260 BCE preserves names of different cow goddesses that had been worshiped uh, since uh, the old kingdom. So Hesat, for example. Um, I'm fairly certain, uh, although there is of course no textual evidence that these cattle pastoralist C group Nubian people also certainly revered the cow as um, part of their um, livelihood. This kept them alive and it was also a status symbol. It had so much important in this pastoralist culture. Um, and that's the point that I'm trying to make that they're probably was an indigenous idea um, of the sacredness of the cow, if not an outright cow goddess that made it natural for these C group Nubian women to um, participate in rites for the Egyptian uh, cow goddess Hathor. Okay, yeah, there was actually another question asking that specifically, the relationship or the significance of the cow in Nubian culture, how that might be related to Egyptians uh, and Hathor. So thank you for addressing that. Um, 
I had another question specifically about Hatshepsut, which is interesting. Someone asks, you mentioned that Hatshepsut constructed her temple near and in a similar style as her ancestor Mentihopa II. Uh, is there any indication of what ancient Egyptian rulers thought about their ancestors or did they have uh, sort of a consciousness about previous dynastic rulers? Absolutely. I mean, the Egyptians blessed us with a very uh, complete and long king list um, where they just inscribed the names of Egyptian kings for hundreds of years. So clearly records were kept of these names. It was very much a part of uh, the presentation of oneself as a legitimate ruler to honor these uh, predecessors. Um, we could only wish for such a thing in, in the kingdom of Kush to the south. I'm sure they did their ancestor worship in a way that, that didn't involve text. Um, but yeah, it's uh, very striking to me that um, both of these powerful rulers, Mentuhotep II and Hatshepsut, are, come from, are very Theban in origin, their power base and their home is in Southern Egypt at Thebes. Um, and so um, Mentuhotep of course built his funerary monument there in his home, in his power base. And the same with Hatshepsut, even though in the interim, the capital seemed to always move up North to Memphis. Um, Hatshepsut is I think making a clear sent, uh, statement about her, um, her roots and her power base being at Thebes in the south and to associate herself with um, this ancestor who, so 2000 BCE to about 1400, it's almost a 600 year difference and this inconceivable amount of time, but to still um, acknowledge this uh, predecessor by building her funerary monument in this area, very sacred to the goddess Hathor. Yes, I definitely agree. You said there's a huge span of time in between Hatshepsut emulating, emulating uh, Mentuhotep II, and it just alludes to sort of the longevity of the history that people might think about their predecessors. And I just want to add one other point. They also were both in, in dynasties and at points in Egyptian history that had intense contact with uh, Nubia. And so I, I think there's a lot of richness they're still to be explored in future scholarship. Okay, yeah, that's a really interesting point about what the relationship might have been, how it might have manifest that we just don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I had another question that asked, could you talk more about the music and instruments that would have accompanied these dances? You uh, referenced briefly the sistrum. Was that particularly important or was there anything else that added to the jubilation of the dance? Absolutely. And so I, I had to take out a lot of slides to make it work for 45 minutes, but um, there were tambourines. So like we saw in that image from the, um, the columns in the temple of uh, Hathor at Philae, so that um, small man playing a tambourine, there was a lot of hand clapping. And so that seems to be really a prominent part um, Further south in Kush, we see images and also actually in Egypt associated with Nubians, pl they're playing uh, a drum um, called a Deluca in um, Sudan, but it's a double headed drum sort of worn on a strap around the neck. And this in Egyptian imagery is really tightly associated uh, with Nubians. And so I'm imagining that this type of drum would have been played as well. Um, and certainly singing. Um, and I'm just going to extrapolate there from the inscriptions that I studied at the Temple of Philae, because a lot of the agreements, the so-called agreements that were inscribed in that forecourt area promised to come and worship the goddess Hathor, but they're also making uh, financial commitments that they're going to bring donations of wealth to the temple and they will be distributed amongst uh, singers, Shamayat, uh, at the temple of, of Isis. And so um, certainly singing was also 
part of this um, ritual and sacred performance. Okay, connecting to the the singing and the instruments, uh, was there any significance to the placement of the tattoos specifically on these women? You had mentioned the the stomach, the thighs, and the the chest or the breasts, I believe. Yes, all very much highlighting um, female erogenous zones, right? So in between the breast on the chest, uh, definitely on the thighs that would have been exposed. If you can imagine the acrobatic flips in leather skirts would have been just flying everywhere. So there would have been exposure. And this actually is part of the performance of the right. It's sort of uh, encoded in a, a myth about um, Hathor exposing her genitalia to her father, Ray, to cheer him up and bring him out of a funk. And so um, these tattoos on the thighs would have been meant to be seen as part of um, the, the movement of the dance. Um, and then down uh, the arms as well. Yeah, it's interesting, the more that we talk about this, there's so many different facets. Um, you know, you have the the visual with the tattoos and the dancing, um, and then you also have the sound with the instruments and this overall performative aspect, which I'm assuming would have been a fantastic thing to be able to witness. And I want to just sort of tag on that because I, I believe, and it's been written that this was all meant to stimulate a so-called epiphany, right? So these would have, these um, music and dance performances would have happened at night with the torches lit in front of the temple. It would have been very communal and a large group of people, lots of beer passed around. So drunkenness, very, um, um, erotic and sexual dancing going on and the the shaking of the sister the shake sacred rattles and the tambourine and the communal singing was all meant to sort of uh do something like the whirling of the dervishes right to put people into a kind of a trance where they can then expect to have an epiphany of the goddess hathor um, and probably maybe even her divine statue would have at Philae been brought out from that small temple out to the front of the main temple to then appear before the worshipers sort of at the, the height of this uh, whole communal sacred ritual. Absolutely. Given everything that you've said, um, I have a question from the audience that asks specifically, do you think that Hathor um, could have originally been a Nubian goddess that was adopted by Egypt? Obviously, uh, this is a bit of a wormhole question, right? There's a lot of connotations around perceived race or blackness and perceived cultural identity, um, you know, and whether that factored into the priestesses being emphasized in this role uh, in the Hathor cult. But do you think that that's a possibility at all that Hathor had those origins? Yeah, yeah. And it definitely will underpin my future research. So I want to really dive deeply into looking at these C group women and they did not engage in writing. And so it's much more looking at the artifacts that they were buried with and that have been excavated in this area between the first and the second cataract. But yes, it's... um. It's quite possible that, that the goddess Hathor, we're told in Egyptian texts that she comes from several named areas in uh, southeastern Nubia. So Knesset or Bugam. Um, and so there is a very tight association of her as being M. Seti, so coming from Nubia. Um, and this may be because there had been a continuous uh, prehistoric uh, worship of some type of a, a cow goddess. Um, it's, I think it's not particularly helpful to sort of distinguish which gods or goddesses or people were um, Egyptian or Nubian because these cultures were so intimately connected throughout all of their history. And of course, derived from a, a common group of people who started moving into the Nile Valley around 5000 BCE when the 
the so-called green Sahara started to dry up. So, um, but yeah, I, I find it very interesting. And I feel like the Egyptian texts testify to that, uh, her association with these named places um, in Nubia. Wonderful. Um, and I do want to leave the audience before we conclude here uh, with a little bit of a teaser. You had mentioned in the beginning that you are writing a, a monograph on the Queens of Kush. Uh, could you speak briefly about the process of writing such a unique and I'm sure to be foundational publication? And what do you think that will mean for scholarship as a whole? Uh, how we maybe view the relationship between Nubia and Egypt? Yeah, it's... Um... It's a, a kind of a gaping hole in what's available to the larger public because I am only aware of one full length book that is dedicated to Kushite queens and it specifically focuses on the queens of the Napatan period of which Egypt's 25th dynasty was a, a part. Um, but it's written in German by an amazing scholar but it's not available to everyone. And so I think I know that this information is really important to correct a unfortunately still uh, living concept of Africa as not having any history. And so highlighting this um, incredibly important culture that, that starts as early as Egypt does, right? We have Perma, Napata, and Meroe as three uh, phases of this kingdom of Kush. It's just, it's really important knowledge to have for scholarship. So if we're talking about trying to diversify our idea of what is a classical society, that this is an African classical civilization. Um, yeah, it's important. It's very important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, that is our time. Uh, that concludes our lecture, as well as the question and answer segment for today. Thank you again to Dr. Ashby for sharing your time and your expertise with myself and our wider audience. Thank you also to our viewers on YouTube for their interest in this scholarship and history and their efforts to engage in recontextualizing and reconceptualizing our past. Uh, please make sure that you join us for the next part of the New Perspectives of Ancient Nubia Lecture Series, which is brought to you again by the Bade Museum and ARF. That one is scheduled for April 5th, so it's a slight change from our normal Thursday since the 5th is a Monday. The lecture is titled, Like the Coming of the Winds, Kushite Pharaohs and Their Armies in the Near East, it will be uh, a lecture by Dr. Jeremy Pope at our usual time of 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So thank you again and have a wonderful day.